Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, welcome to this webinar, which is being presented or has been put together by Sub-Saharan Congenital Anomalies Network and the Global Health Network. Today's session will be on birth defect surveillance why and how the African experience. Now, as you are aware, we have had uh, two other webinars also organized by the same. So this is the third. As we can see, we have a very, very packed uh, agenda or program for the day. And I will be chairing the session. My name is Asumta Murevi. I'm a pediatrician working for WHO at the Regional Office for Africa based in Brazzaville, Congo. I am the focal person for newborn health. For this session, which will take us about one and a half hours, we'll have four presentations, as you can see outlined in the program. Now, for today, like I said, the, 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 the webinar is being put together by Sub-Saharan African Congenital Anomaly Network. Now, this is a seed project to establish an African Congenital Anomaly Network. And it is funded by the UK Research and Innovation Medical Research Council in collaboration with Macquarie Research uh, Consortium the primary aim of the network is to improve the diagnosis of congenital anomalies and care of the affected children and family and to promote the identification of their causes. I think this we have to all admit that it still has a long way to go, especially in our region. This we do so by building an evidence based through surveillance and research, improving capacity for collaboration research, paving an impact pathway on policy and, research, uh, and practice. Uh, the network establishment is led by a team of co-investigators working together with partners from 10 African countries, UK and US. The aim is to establish a network and build capacity by training health professionals. With webinar, uh, through webinars and other resources. Today's webinar, or the objectives, uh, like I said, it's the third one, will focus on surveillance at African sites, prevalence and care of congenital anomalies. We'll also share the current status and activities of new, emerging, and established birth defect surveillance in Africa. Thank you. I'm now going to call upon our first presenter. Actually, there are two, they'll present together. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Zash, who is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School a practicing infectious disease physician and a research associate with the Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute partnership. Her research focuses on the safety of antiretroviral medic medications in pregnancy and improving birth outcomes for pregnant people living with HIV. They will co-present with Dr. Modiegi Diseko, who is a trained midwife she worked as a midwife in the government hospitals before joining Botswana Harvard AIDS Institute Partnership as a research uh, nurse. She, she was involved in several studies focused on pediatric HIV before she became a study coordinator for the SEPATO, SEPAMO study. Rebecca and Boki have been working together since the inception of the project in 2014. So welcome. Rebecca and the second. 
Good day, everyone. Um, I would like to thank you for giving us a Supama team to come and share with you our, our, our lessons we learned from our study. Just to start, uh, my name is Mudir Hidiseko, and I'll just go to the uh, overview of the Supama study. Um, the Supama study is the best outcome surveillance study that was started in 2014. It is funded by NI. PhD and the PI is Dr. Roger Shapiro. The original primary aims of the study were to one, um, evaluate adverse out best outcomes by HIV status and ART status. And the, the other one is to determine if there was an increase, there was an increased risk in neural tube defects among infants born to if evidence exposed uh, from conception. One of the main reasons we started this study was because we felt there was lack of data on the safety of antiretroviral antiretroviral. Though the magnitude of ART exposure in pregnancy in countries with outweighs that seen for any other drug in history. For example, in Botswana, one in five women one in five of all the births in the country is exposed to ART in utero, and 70% of them are exposed from conception. So the Tepama study started at eight sites, um, maternity wards, and then we later expanded to 18 maternity wards, of which initially we covered 40% of all the Best, but later then improved to seven, increased to 70%. So the research assistants, what they do, they abstract data from maternity records for all consecutive in hospital births at our site. So um, as you can see, here is our, uh, uh, our amazing picture of the Supermotive team. Yes, we took it uh, before um, the COVID era. So these people, they work tirelessly and often alone in, in their remote site so that they can be able to collect data for our study. So one of the first lessons that we learned is that in order for us to succeed, we really need to have a, a good team so that we can depend on this team and then we choose wisely, we train them as long as it takes so that they understand and we try to keep them happy. In terms of how we collect data for congenital abnormalities, we started before the study with training of the midwives at all our sites in the inf with the infant surface exam and CAs. We used the WHO surface exam video, then gave each site an atlas of congenital abnormalities and aimed for yearly training at all our sites in order to ensure quality, good quality of data collection. To capture the data of on all of the CAs that occur in our site, what, uh, what happens is that when the midwife comes across an abnormality during, during surface exam, she alerts our, our research assistant, and then we refund just to compensate for the time, for the airtime they used with 20 pillar airtime for each notification. Um, the details of the abnormality are clearly written in the maternity card by the midwife as part of Standard, care, standard of care. Then after our RA has been notified by the midwife, she goes ahead and co attempts co to consent the mother for a photo. And this photo is being reviewed within three months by Dr. Lewis Holmes, who is the medical geneti geneticist in Boston. In addition to this photo, the description written from the midwife and diagnosis made by local Doctor are collected in the Tsepamo data in the in the, the, the Tsepamo data set. In case where the mother does not consent for an abnormality or a photo is take is not taken for any reason, we, we rely on the description of the abnormality to try to classify the abnormality. So our our, our research assistant records the description of the abnormality in a red cap da database. The RA then reviews the description with the study coordinator in order to make sure that the information is correct for classification. 
There are some exceptions for this, which we do not need to discuss, like birthmark, umbilical hernia, hyperextended uh, leg, extra digits, uh, or alb albinism. And if the description is not enough, then as the study coordinator, we go ahead and ask the RA or, or talk to the RA, or even we speak to the midwives or the doctor directly in order for us to get more information. For our method methodology, one of the questions we have to consider was which birth defects can we reasonably consider except to capture it, and expect to capture in our setting. This includes thinking about what kind of detail we would be able to get and would help us to lead up to how to find major abnormalities in our study. We decided to pre-specify that, that major abnormalities would be, de would be de uh, defined as a structural defect of clinical, surgical, or cosmetic significance. And we would exclude genetic syndrome or positional deformities. The reason we went to for this definition was that in our setting, we don't usually have advanced di diagnostics like CT or MRI or genetics. We can only capture abnormalities that are feasible on physical exam at birth so that we can know, we, we, would, we knew we wouldn't be able to, to capture cardiac defects or internal organ, organ defect. And also we can't analyze defects that, are, that, are, that aren't assessed on every baby. We know that we can't reliably capture every isolated left palate, unseated, and undescended testes, and hip dysplasia because not every midwife is, is exa examining for this. We do still collect these diagnoses when they occur, but we, we try not to compare the frequency by different ART treatment because that would be biased. So because of these constraints in, Im in imaging and diagnostics, we can't use ICD 9, 9, 9 over 10, 9 or 10 asset classification 15. Some of that we find in, in Tepamo are easy to classify based on the appearance like neural tube defect, omphalocele, gastroscasis, left lip, but many defects are classified more generally like major limb defect, multiple abnormalities, or unclear etiology. This leads to a, one of the, the second lesson that we learned that we need to choose our the definition for major malformations and classification system before starting and we need to make sure it will work within our settings. Thank you, and Rebecca, the research will continue from here. Thank you, Modi, I think. Um, so I'm gonna switch a little bit and discuss sort of some overviews of um, what we've been finding and some of the challenges. Um, so in Sapamo, there's about uh, 35,000 deliveries per year that we collect information on. And in 2020, um, there are 1,076 abnormalities reported, which is about 3% of all the births. Um, of these uh, 1,076, uh, 32 were reported by the midwife as an abnormality but confirmed not to be an abnormality by the doctor uh, at the hospital before our review. Only three were unable to classify as major or minor given our definition. Um, this was something like abnormal leg or deformed head without further information. 78% um, of the abnormalities reported uh, were classified as minor abnormalities, and 22% were major abnormalities. Of minor abnormalities, uh, the vast majority were postaxial polydactyly type B, the small extra digit uh, on the pinky side uh, that's tied off at birth and doesn't cause problem. The other most common um, minor abnormalities were umbilical hernia, uh, Anglogothplasia, hyperextended leg, uh, dental cysts, and birthmarks. So we saw after about two years how many of the uh, abnormalities we were taking photos of were, were minor, eight out of 10. And we thought, should we continue 
to take photos and consent and do all this work um, around these minor abnormalities. And what we ended up deciding to do was to no longer require photos of most of the minor abnormalities like umbilical hernia, tongue tie, um, and the rest. But we did keep taking pictures of the postaxial polydactyles. And what we realized is that we could use this as an internal control for quality assurance. So about 1% of all births have the extra digit in Botswana. And so anytime each individual site started to dip down uh, well below 1%, we would go there and find out were they still assessing uh, the babies, were they still getting exams. Um, and so this was a very efficient way for us to monitor our sites uh, for, for looking for the abnormalities in every baby. And that's a, that was a big lesson because I think it helped us a lot um, to have an internal control that's easy to track when you have multiple sites, because um, it's otherwise very challenging to do it efficiently. Uh, and then um, another very important thing that, that we really knew going into the study because of, of prior work was that um, we had to look at stillbirths. So in Sapamo, uh, almost one in four major abnormalities have been identified in stillborn infants. Um, and so what we did, because we knew this would be an issue, was in the training, we concentrated on, on very clearly training midwives to do infant exams on all the births, including stillbirths. One of the unanticipated challenges we had in the study was really how emotionally difficult it was for our research assistants to view and photograph the stillborn infants with the abnormalities. Um, these are not trained healthcare professionals, and, and for many of them, it was their first time in this kind of setting. And so this really required careful desensitization and ongoing support and counseling uh, for our research assistants. But this is a, one of our very clear lessons from Zapamo that in any surveillance, um, I think it's critical to include stillbirths in order to get a true idea of the uh, presence of major malformations. Then there were some specific challenges we had with using photographs uh, for classification and diagnosis. There's just some major abnormalities that are not well visualized in a two-dimensional uh, photograph. Things like a uh, club foot. Um, sometimes it's hard to tell if it's just a positional deformity when you can't be there to manipulate the baby's foot. Um, also hydrocephalus, um, some instances are very clear, but others, it, it's very hard to tell whether it, it's really hydrocephalus or it's just a familial uh, large head. Um, others like major limb defects where we don't have x-ray or, or further imaging, you can't determine exactly what the abnormality is, though you can see visually that it's a major um, abnormality. For hypospadias, it can be difficult to visualize where the urethral opening is. We've tried to get um, uh, photographs using, you know, where they're, they're pointing toward the opening, but that's been a big challenge. And then dental abnormalities. Uh, it's very difficult to take a, a picture of uh, a newborn infant uh, who won't open their mouth when you ask. But despite these challenges, uh, we've also had a lot of success with this methodology uh, of, for SEPAMO. Um, and I'll go through a little bit of this. So when Botswana rolled out a new antiretroviral regimen, uh, which included dolutegravir, which was um, one of the best antiretrovirals um, that we had at the time, but had not been studied in pregnancy at all. Uh, the SAPAMO study was already in place, and so we were able to provide the world's first data on the safety of using dolutegravir. And our first analysis looked at people who had started their dolutegravir during pregnancy, not before conception. Uh, and pretty quickly, we were able to show um, that, and you can see this in the bars here, that the instances of adverse birth outcomes and severe adverse birth outcomes 
um, were very similar to the older antiretroviral regimen, uh, which included efavirenz. And this was very reassuring um, to many people around the world and helped start the discussions of whether we could use dolutegravir um, all over the globe. In this uh, analysis, we had a small number, about 280 of women who started DTG in the first trimester, although most of them was pretty late, uh, around 10 weeks. And we didn't find any uh, excess birth defects in that group. With a little bit of a longer time, um, we were able to look at, at the prevalence of birth defects in people who had started their dolutegravir before conception and throughout pregnancy. And what we did find here was, was less positive initially, where we saw an increased risk of neural tube defects with those who took dolutegravir at conception. And this caused a, a major problem uh, for the rollout of antiretrovirals. Um, and not just in our setting, but really all over the world. We had um, US guidelines, European guidelines, African, South American WHO guidelines at the time uh, restricting or, or recommending not using dolutegravir uh, until we were able to get more data. Um, and you know, there was a lot of lessons we could learn from this, and, and I won't go into everything that happened, but I actually think one of the most important things um, that we learned from, from this experience was that it's, it's critical to do congenital anomaly surveillance in settings where the disease burden is high. And there's really no reason that this can't be done well in a lower resource setting, as I'm sure everyone here agrees. But you know, we had to convince uh, a lot of people when we first came out with this data that just because this study was done in Botswana does not mean that it, it wasn't done well. Um, but I think we did convince them. And I think, again, it, it's critical to do these studies in these settings. And, and I know they can be done well. Um, one thing that kind of got lost amongst the, the excitement around dolutegravir and neural tube defects is that in this analysis that we did and we published, we actually, uh, in table two, also published um, the prevalence of all the major defects that we found. And this was between 2014 and 2019. And, and I think that this was one of the, the larger studies that has been done um, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, looking at all structural malformations. And we have a plan to do an analysis um, similar to this, but for a longer time period um, through 2022, looking at the prevalence of um, the major defects in Botswana, as well as some of the risk factors uh, for these defects. So you can all be uh, looking for that next year. And then I just wanted to end um, on a slide where I, I say what we wished we could have had in Sapamo, but we didn't to really have made our study even better. Um, one of the things we wished for was an on-call local clinical geneticist to examine the infants with, with major abnormalities, um, especially in select cases, which were difficult. And we do think this could be done by telemedicine, but, but it just uh, reminds us of the shortage of clinical geneticists um, in Botswana and other countries. Um, we also wish we would have collected a video of the surface exam instead of, or at least in addition to just still photographs as I think this would give us a better idea um, for some of those that are difficult on photo alone. Uh, we wish we had x-ray or ultrasound for all the major limb defects. Um, we wish we could do autopsies for stillborn infants with major abnormalities. And we really wish that we could do a pediatric evaluation or longer term follow-up for all of these abnormalities. And really that would help us um, with infants with dysmorphic features, uh, reported hydrocephalus, and, and club foot. Um, so if we, if we were going to add or do this again, or for anybody who's thinking of do this, these are some of the things that we wish we had. So I'll stop there, and I, I don't think we're going to do questions now, um, but just wanted to say that we would love for anyone to visit Botswana and, and learn more about our study um, if anyone is ever interested. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Zash and Dr. 
Iseko for that very interesting uh, presentation. Yes, I know I have heard about it and some of the outcomes, especially regarding birth defects. And um, I hope we'll generate a few questions. Uh, please, people, don't forget to put your questions in the Q&A. We are going to address them after the next session. Thank you. Next, we will have Dr. George Bello. I hope he has managed to connect. Who we'll present? Uh, who is the principal investigator for the Malawi? Or he present on the Malawi birth defects surveillance study. Now, Dr. George is working for ITEC Malawi as the HIV surveillance technical director and seconded to the Ministry of Health to support in the implementation of HIV surveillance activities. He is the principal investigator for that Malawi that surveillance study. Welcome, George. Okay, um, I will be sharing uh, the Malawi experience uh, in setting up our birth defect surveillance uh, system. As a way of background, so I'm failing to move from when, okay, so it's moving. Yeah, so as a way of background, I think the uh, idea of conducting birth defect surveillance here in Malawi was first. Um, conceptualized by our donor, uh, CDC, after observing uh, some defects of newborn uh, uh, newborn children. So based on that uh, conceptualization, so the issue was now, um, was discussed with the, the Malawi government uh, to get their buy-in. And um, when the ministry indeed uh, noted that uh, I think this, we do see some defects in our uh, babies in the hospitals yet, but we don't have a thorough system to monitor that one, and it was easily uh, adopted by the ministry. So uh, in our study, um, it was now at the uh, setting up of the study, uh, that birth defect surveillance, it was in the form of a study, um, which had two main objectives. So the uh, first objective of that study was to set up First of all, to establish the actual system for major birth defect surveillance among all live and still births. So that are born in the uh, selected sites. So in our case, we had four sites that we identified. So under this um, first objective, we had a number of uh, specifics, but I would point out the first objective was to determine our uh, baseline prevalence of uh, these major defects among live and still births of all gestational ages. So the uh, second critical specific one was to compare, the last one which you see, number four, was to compare the prevalence of major external birth defects of prematurity and low birth weight among newborns of HIV negative women to those HIV um, infected women on ART and HIV. So primarily since this was also an HIV related uh, study, that's why the last two are objective, specific objective was necessary to be added. So we had the second part of this. Um, you can see the first objective is more of a surveillance system, which we routinely collect data and uh, analyze it and give us uh, which can inform policies. So routine data collection, setting up the system. But the second objective we did um, uh, was to now to pin out, to identify the risk factors that are associated with the major external birth defects among newborns. Primarily on this one, we had to, uh, to determine if maternal use of uh, ARVs and contramoxas so during very early in pregnancy is uh, highly associated with the higher risk of birth defects uh, in these babies. Of course, we have also additional one where we had to assess uh, maternal exposure to various uh, drug regimens like for malaria, uh, TB, um, uh, articulars and the drugs, uh, they associated with the uh, birth defects occurrence. So these are the major two. Now you can see the first objective was to set up a system which will be ongoing, but 
For this, uh, the second one is now to pin out to do what we call a nest, nest decay control study so that we are able to analyze the risk factors that are associated um, with these defects. So we have a number of risk factors. These are just to isolate a uh, few. So uh, in here, what I, I want also to share how we are implementing um, uh, our study. So uh, it has two components. The first is where we had to hire co uh, college of medicine to implement the, this study uh, from December 2016 to around September 2020. So in that phase, we had to hire what we call uh, highly, I mean, dedicated staff uh, for the project. So it means everybody who was working there was fully paid. And uh, we had about 40 study nurses plus uh, we had site managers, research assistants. We had also project coordinator who had to oversee the uh, project implementation and also a nursing manager to coordinate the nurses. And um, at that time, at each facility, we had uh, clinicians who had to, which, uh, we, whom we call the study physician, who were there to support the study implementation at the site level. So, and also they had to confirm all our uh, birth defects and the such confirmations were captured in our uh, data collection tools so that it can be compared at a later date by when it is confirmed by our experts from ICBDR. And then we'll be able to compare the concordance between the start level uh, confirmations as well as the, uh, the physician. And so far, it has shown that there is a 100% concordance, except in one minor. Uh, birth defect, which we showed there was some differences between the two. So the idea behind, if our local team is able to have that high precision in terms of um, confirmations, it means when we are expanding, when the means is uh, rolling out the system to other facilities, we should be able to use the local physicians to be able to confirm. So the second bit of uh, the implementation is where we had the the BDS being implemented uh, in a form of uh, a combination of uh, dedicated staff and the um, Minister of Health uh, staff. Where, so the purpose of this is now to empower the ministry uh, to be able to implement the activities of, uh, of the birth defects. And then if they are able to do it as we are implementing as a partner, by the time uh, because we know funding may not be forever. By the time funding is not there, so the minister would have had um, the experience uh, in terms of implementing the uh, birth defects surveillance to a level that the results generated will be able to inform policy. So that's the bit which started in October 2020 uh, onwards, and we hope to, to do this process for a number of uh, 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 years. Uh, with the funding allowing, and therefore, with the time, will be minimal, I mean, reducing the number of nurses who are fully dedicated, hired for the study, so that the ministry uh, number of nurses should be overtaking uh, the implementation. It's like more of a transitioning process uh, in terms of uh, implementation of the uh, surveillance system in Malawi. So, uh, still, our BDS implementation procedures continued here. I think the study, as I mentioned, is implemented in four uh, facilities. These are the facilities after ranking the highest volume uh, deliveries. Facilities with the higher volumes of deliveries were ranked, and the first four sites were picked. And these are the sites uh, for those who, are, who are, may not be uh, familiar with Malawi, but we have Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital. It's our referral hospital, the big referral hospital in Malawi located in the south. We have Guaira. Guaira is a maternity hospital. It's a hospital, it's a larger hospital in central region, but it's one of the district facilities, but it's the largest in terms of deliveries. And this is located in central uh, Lilongwe, the central, central of Malawi. And we have Mangochi. Uh, it's also a district hospital, which is located eastern part of Mangochi, I mean, uh, of Malawi. And uh, finally, we had also another central hospital, uh, a central uh, region facility we call Nchewotis Hospital. So these are the four sites that showed the, uh, the higher uh, deliveries. So the reason being, 
Based duplex surveillance requires facilities that do deliver more babies so that you are able to get the required number of uh, uh, babies for you to do some kind of analysis. So uh, you can see if we had to do what we call randomization in terms of selecting the sites, it would be really hard to get the biggest sites and therefore we end up going to facilities with a fewer and therefore knowing both defects are slightly rare, we will not be able to get a reasonable number to respond to our research questions. So in implementing this uh, birth defects, we do uh, collect uh, what you call demographic and based for medical records information from all beds. This is the uh, surveillance component. Since our study, it has two components, surveillance and uh, the nested case control. So part of the surveillance, that's what we do. And uh, the information is obtained uh, routinely from the hospitals uh, through uh, labor charts, delivery registries, health passports, or clinic records. So in implementing that one, we just abstract this information from the existing records to fill up some of the uh, uh, variables. So all infants uh, in this surveillance component, all infants are examined for external birth defects by trained midwives. So we, what we did was to train uh, the midwives. They had to undergo a number of uh, training sessions. Firstly, they had to do what we call a Geneva, and uh, we had another uh, Arusha training materials. If they have passed that one, they had now to go to do GCP training, uh, HSP training, and then when they have successful pass these other trainings, they had to undergo the what we call a protocol training, and uh, where they had to align um, using the SOPs for each component of um, uh, the study. So all those nurses who had passed, then they had to be um, assessed and then start the implementation of this uh, birth defect surveillance. So in this implementation, when a, a, when a woman uh, delivers a baby with a major external birth defect, it's a, um, we do request if pictures can be taken uh, from the baby uh, for, for the defect of interest. And uh, then we use the, uh, these pictures for diagnosis. Firstly, uh, the site level physician will review the pictures quality in terms of the angle taken. And then these fi uh, pictures will be sent to ICBDR for now final confirmation, which will be compared with our local confirmation done by our physicians at the hospital. So then uh, all uh, consenting uh, women uh, to have these pictures taken, then we had to do it. For non-consenting women who don't want their babies to be photographed, then the nurses were requested to do what we call a sketch of the defect uh, in relation to the position of uh, uh, the body parts. And then with a good description to describe that one, it, then it, the picture that in a sketch plus the, uh, the diagnosis were now submitted to the I mean to ICBDR. Uh, now to guide their confirmations. So uh, that's the uh, surveillance component. So surveillance component, the only consent was to getting pictures, but otherwise the rest, if it was not a case, uh, there was no consent uh, given during the uh, data collection. But now, Birth defect. The baby had to be matched. I mean, had to be. We had to have three controls selected for that uh, major birth defect case. And uh, to, and these cases were matched by the facility where these babies are born. So if you have a defect at the Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital, then your controls should come from the same facility. And the way we link them, we use this ID code, a barcode, where the uh, a barcode for the main case will be repeated in the cases, in the controls, so that we can now, um, my, I mean, allocate this control to a specific case. So in terms of selecting these controls, normally we had to, if a defect has occurred, the subsequent three uh, had to be uh, selected to my, uh, for that uh, major case. 
So in this uh, case control, uh, they had to, before even, before them to start to be uh, enrolled in a case control study, they had to provide what we call a written informed person for both the, the controls as well as the cases for them to answer additional questions. So because it required some additional questions to probe the exposures to various medications, then that was needed uh, to, to, I think at least uh, some kind of consenting was needed for both the cases, case mothers and the control mothers. So for us, we are using our, our tablets and the, 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 when we do the tablets data collection, then the, um, we, we built in what we call a QC system. So a tablet data will be collected by one NS and the, that NS will be able to do some uh, uh, data uh, quality checking. But uh, before now uh, uploading the uh, data, uh, the NS, actual, actual tablet is given to somebody else a second NS, or it can be a site manager also to do QC. When, it's, uh, when there are no issues, then the uh, data set is uploaded to a central server. Should there be issues during that uh, QC, then um, uh, it's referred back to the uh, NS who did the uh, data collection or had to now to complete, I mean, to at least to resolve the uh, challenges identified during the QC. And once that one is done, it's now sent to a central server. So as I said, the all birth defects uh, then are compiled from the server by a data manager and also the descriptions for each one. And then they summarize this in the form of a PowerPoint with the actual pictures as well as the descriptions. And, the, uh, the, and then that bit is now summarized and sent to our ICBDR for final confirmation. So the results which come from uh, ICBDR are treated as final, and uh, we just compare it with ours uh, to see if we are doing fine or we are now away from the uh, final diagnosis made by our experts. So uh, in terms of uh, who do we, or do we include in this study, uh, we all, all informative beds, whether they are alive or stillborn, regardless of gestation age, are uh, included uh, in this study. I know in some studies, they have what you call age limit for somebody to be included, but in our study, we are including everybody into the study so that we have a complete uh, set of birth defects uh, occurring in our facilities. Should there be okay. now cutoff points in terms of um, that will be done at the time of analysis. So we do exclude infants born out of uh, these hospitals. Also, we do exclude my selected beds where we will be, we are not a certain presence or absence of uh, any defects. So those ones are excluded. And also we do exclude infants with birth defects which are known are diagnosed after discharge from the hospital. I think the reason yes. being, uh, yeah. we do exclude them to avoid it because we know some people may be diagnosed after discharge but the rate of diagnosis may differ between individuals. Some may not be diagnosed yet, they have the, the defect. So to, uh, to remove that bias, then we do exclude uh, those people diagnosed afterwards. Dr. George, you need to wrap up. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so in terms of congenital anomalies, well, the ones we look at are the ones you see here, neural tube defects. Uh, the, uh, I think you can see the defects are uh, highlighted here. Uh, this is also a continuation of the same uh, defects. But in terms of, uh, I think this table, I just wanted to summarize. Yeah, we did the study mode up to uh, the first before, uh, before transition to DTG. Um, uh, these, these are the results. Overall, we have now recruited 151,000. This is pre-COVID time. But now after we, are, we have resumed, we have a number of cases, but they are not yet confirmed by our ICBDR. So, so far, we have 812 uh, major defects coming from seven as well, six babies. So some had multiple defects. So the lessons we've learned, challenges, when you're implementing a surveillance component, there are an issue of good storage of source documents. So since we are using a routinely collected one, we are not able to collect these ones, and therefore, we, to avert that problem, we had to adopt an electronic form as a document. 
when uh, this was uh, in terms of uh, when the monitors come, the source documents for our data set will be the electronic one. So the second challenge or lessons learned was um, uh, this need to orient the uh, uh, nurses, I mean the MOH nurses, uh, for them to uh, fully fill our forms because they had to show some critical gaps and inconsistencies in the measurements. Since we are using those routine, and uh, when we did our analysis uh, measurements, they were giving some inconsistencies, therefore that orientation was needed. And also missing of beds. We noted that the system at the start, you tend to miss some beds, but you tend to resolve it with, uh, with time when you set up some uh, mechanisms to address these challenges. And also we had to revise some SOPs to address the missing of beds. Oh, and on, uh, one of the last bit of this is transitioning to MOH. We have noted that uh, engaging in MOH nurses to support BDS is very challenging. Uh, and the majority of them may not be coming to support the BDS so that now that transitional knowledge may not be uh, gained. And uh, primarily this is a pure primary due to uh, staff shortages in the uh, government system. So any systems which involves in, um, MOH, it needs to uh, take into account the uh, shortages at that level, or else what we need is to integrate the operation of the birth defects as a routine activity, as they are now uh, conducting the routine deliveries, they can also be collecting minimal information for the birth defects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bello. Sorry for rushing you, but we are running out of time. Thank you, and I think you your presentation also really gives us an insight on what is happening in um, Malawi as, you know, in forging the way to putting in a system that will uh, document uh, the bad defects that are happening. And we see the challenges that you have outlined. Now I'm going to give two minutes to responses. Maybe I'll give... Um, uh, Professor Zash, uh, one minute to look at one of the questions that is there. I see one has been, I think, responded to in the chat. So over to you, Zash, and then uh, Dr. Bello, you also have a question there. Um, Professor Zash. Oh, um, yeah, if I'm seeing the chat correctly, um there was a question on what proportion of our anomalies were in the live births. Um, I actually don't have that information with me, um, only to say that about 75% were in live births and 25% and were in still births. But um, I can look at that information and be in touch with you um, if that would help. Thank you very much. And thank you for being precise. Um, Dr. Bello, there's a question there. Uh, and um, about QC, how does a senior nurse do, do this? And do they re-examine the child with congenital affirmation again, or check for completion of data collected? Maybe you can respond to that. OK. Um, well, first of all, well, we know these congenital anomalies are rare. So any congenital anomaly, uh, it means uh, all the nurses on duty, including the uh, site manager, the senior nurse, who assess it and now assess the photographs uh, taken during that process. But now what, uh, what happens at a later date is more of the, um, the data collected itself. Is it, uh, there are some gaps, uh, there are some persistence, and you do some minimal comparison with the source documents. If it's a, a pathograph, then they will compare some critical information uh, with the pathograph. If the information we have here is exactly the same from where this, uh, this nurse was getting the data. So the QC at that stage is more of the data collected because the actual anomaly is uh, observed as a team. And then they make a conclusion from that, uh, that side and even agree the quality of pictures already collected at that time to avoid the, uh, the baby uh, leaving the hospital. So that one is done simultaneously. Thank you very much. There's another one in the chat, uh, which was asking what lab tests have you done? And what about Zika and Torches test? Maybe in one sentence, thank you. 
Yeah, so we are not doing any lab tests. Uh, I think our study wanted to include Zika, but uh, it was dropped before even implementation. So what we don't do any lab tests, you're only relying on this physical examination by our nurses and the physicians. Thank you very much. Now I want to invite our next presenter, who is Dr. Ayede Adejumuke Idou. Uh, Dr. Ayede is a senior lecturer. Uh, uh, she's a senior and a consultant pediatrician with the Department of Pediatrics College of University, uh, College of Medicine, University of Ibadan, and University College Hospital. She is also a joint lecturer in the Department of Epidemiology and Medical Statistics in the Faculty of Public Health at the same university. Currently, she is the team lead for perinatal health research, newborn and child survival research consortium, Center for Africa, newborn health and nutrition in the same university. Welcome, Dr. Ayed. You have 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And then um, all protocols duly observed. So thank you, Chair. I'm presenting bad defense surveillance in Nigeria, and I'm going to share the Ibadan experience. So this is the outline. I work in a teaching hospital, and I'm also a, a lecturer in College of Medicine. So these are the two institutions that I currently work. In University of Ibadan and then the, and the University College Hospital, we have a very large team because when we started the issue of bad defects, our vision was very broad. We wanted to be able to diagnose early and to be able to have a comprehensive multidisciplinary team that will manage those babies early. And we also wanted to have a research component that will be able to answer some of the common questions about, that, about bad defects particularly in the aspect of mobility, the social component, the psychological component, the, the sequence of events that follows those babies post-delivery, and also associations with some common drugs taken in pregnancy. So we have this team, and then I'm the current chair. My co-chair is a, a neurosurgeon, and then we also have a secretary, so of highly comprehensive. So we have a cardiology, team as well, endocrine genetics, and then of course, pediatric surgery. We have the nephrology team, the craniofacial, the prenatal screening. Prenatal screening was included because my institution started the prenatal screening program in the country and is so well established. We also have a um, very big uh, obstetric team and the other teams include the ophthalmologists, the urologists, and then at the beginning, we actually included some policymakers from the Federal Ministry of Health. So we had these strategies that we used to set up the group. The core members had a shared vision. So we had our set goals and objectives, and we had an agreement. And then we started with monthly token, all the things we've done so far, we paid by ourselves. We did not have any grants. We did not have any institutional support much in terms of finance. Neither did the Federal Minister of Health or WHO Nigeria give us any money. It was our personal contributions that has taken us thus far. And then at the initial st stage, after setting up the group, we decided to do a baseline data collection to be able to tell us the body, to have an idea of the types of bad defects that are common. Then we also wanted to make some publications this. So we have publication target, targets. We also, at the beginning, started seeking institutional support and also finding ways in which bad defects surveillance can actually be institutionalized so that it will not depend on grants, but it will become routine. And that was why we had the Federal Minister of Health in Abuja involved with the team at the, at the beginning. We also joined the International Clearinghouse for Bad Defense about a year after we started 
the group. And we were invited to attend the meeting for African Biodiverse Surveillance Group in Tanzania. I think that was 2016. So we have about five publications to show us the common bad defects that we, that we encounter in our institutions. This was a retrospective data, but most importantly was our anomaly ultrasound screening program that we developed. So we felt that it was an opportunity for us to share the experiences of having a prenatal screening program, the uh, souvenirs that we use for patients, the leaflets, the question and answers, the common question and answer leaflet. So this particular um, publication allowed us to share that for some other institutions to be able to learn from what we are doing in Ibadan. We also had a list of the common bad defects generally based on our five-year retrospective survey. So where we were able to identify some of the common ones that we will include in our proposal, which I will tell us later. So we also look into the pediatric component and we, we were able to identify that almost a third of our patients were actually from surgical pediatric cases, which emphasizes the role of pediatric surgeons in bad defect surveillance. The craniofacial defects were also very, very important. And then we, we share the experience of the easy way that we do this craniofacial defect and surgery in, 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 in Ibadan, which is still ongoing. Some other publications that actually follow this by the subgroup of the craniofacial defect. So at the end of the publications, we develop a protocol following the Tanzania meeting. And then we were able to have a mini collaboration with the Bad Defense Surveillance Group in Italy, and then of also CDC USA, where we were able to learn from experiences of some other African countries like, like Tanzania and Kenya. And this actually helped us to be able to straighten some things about bad defense surveillance. Most importantly, what the experiences in Tanzania and Kenya did to us was to make us to like reduce the broad, the broad vision and try and streamline so that we could be able to start small and then gradually move bigger. So this was the main target of, of the proposal. And then we had selected site. It was meant to be University College Hospital situated in uh, Oyo State, Southwestern Nigeria. And that is one of the highest densely populated cities in Southwestern parts of, of the country. The city has over 3 million population and an average birth rate of about 4.5% per year. We selected three facilities, University College Hospital in Badon, Adio Your Maternity Hospital, and Olu Yoru Catholic Hospital, with an average birth rate of two to 6,000 births per annum. So we had these objectives, were to determine the prevalence of neural tube defect, orofacial talipes, and all that as listed. We also want to identify the clinical and social demographic associations with the prevalence of this defect and to also quantify the human and financial resources required to provide medical care for the affected children. These were our three main objectives in the proposal. And we have this inclusion and exclusion criteria. They are common to virtually all bad defects, but just for emphasis sake, we are to look for, look at these babies, both the ones that are born live, as well as still birth. But we targeted babies less than one, I mean more than one gram, one kilogram at birth. We did not want to look at babies that, um, deliver, that are delivered from other hospitals once they are referred. So these were just the major um, exclusion criteria. So 
These are the bad effects that we included, and these were obtained from our local data, from our hospital data, from the baseline that we did. So the neural tube defect, the orofacial cleft, the musculoskeletal, common musculoskeletal defect like talipis, coronavirus, the anorectal malformations. The anorectal malformations were the major ones seen by the pediatric uh, surgical group. Others included gastroschisis and then ophalosy. A lot of isopospedias were also seen, so we included this in the data that we plan to collect. We also used the opportunity to design a flow, a flow, a proposed flow, because part of our goal was also to be able to share our experience across the country. So we were identifying things that we felt were innovations, that will be able to allow us to share our experience for other centers that may want to join us or start their own, depending on the region of the country they were. So we had this flow from the time you pick the patient, where do you go to next, what do you do next, who are the people that we see, how do you collect data, what do you do with the data. So it's a more, of, more it's an easy diagram to follow. So when we had finished the preliminary review, we actually made a presentation with the Nigerian Society of Neonatal Medicine. And the presentation attracted our being invited to the Federal Minister of Health in Abuja to share our experiences. Other centers were actually invited. When the Federal Minister of Health contacted us, they gave us three main objectives to provide an orientation so that there will be that awareness because it's currently contributing significantly to under five mortality. Well, the meeting was also to examine specific activities that will be necessary for us to have a viable bad effects surveillance in Nigeria. And then of course, for the major stakeholders to have a general consensus on the way to establish bad effects surveillance in Nigeria. So the highlight of that meeting from our preliminary presentations, we were able to identify to some extent the body, we were able to appreciate the body of bad effects from about five institutions. We also look into the challenges, the challenges of not being able to record, the challenges of uh, people not being knowledgeable enough. The fact that a lot of doctors overlook bad defect. It's not in the main agenda of the government. So therefore it is not properly funded. We also review the ethical considerations, taking pictures, what are the things that need to be done? Do we need to develop a standard form constant for all the facilities or particular facility that is involved in bad defect? We also looked at the existing opportunities who are the people that have been trained? Who are the people that are interested? Which facilities are supporting or are ready to support? And at the end of the day, we had some recommendations on how to move forward. Some of these recommendations include the need for us to develop a strategic document as a country on bad defense surveillance, to also constitute a core group to develop a draft of action protocol, and also to identify the tools that are necessary and the forms that we will, we will use as a data collect collection tools and the type of training that will be needed. Then also to institutionalize bad defect, at least to start with in two facilities in each of the six geopolitical zones, and to also incorporate bad defect surveillance information on the health management information, which will be a long-term plan. So at the end of the day, we were to go and have an action plan, protocols developed and tools also formulated. Now, the, all these meetings were held in 2017. The major successes that we have been able to achieve from that time to now, to 2021, is that we've been able to achieve the buy-in by the Federal Minister of Health. 
The Federal Minister of Health actually rejuvenated the Child Health Technical Working Group and carved out a subcommittee that will be working on children with special needs. And bad defect is a major component of that particular subcommittee. And I'm currently the co-chair. So this is the first time that we've been able to draw the attention of Federal Minister of Health into bad defect problems in Nigeria to the extent that a subcommittee has been formed. So what are our current needs? What do we need to, to make progress? We've been able to get the institutions to buy in, the Federal Minister of Health to buy in, but definitely government alone cannot do it. So we still need to be supported by many grants, at least to start off. We need more of institutional support, particularly the one we are doing in Ibadan is that specific nurses should be set aside. And then some doctors in obstetrics and neonatal works that are on routine posting should have bad defense surveillance as part of their routine data. And this we also make um, to the point that we may need some dedicated staff to also enter the, the information that we will get before we can now draw inferences and then use the, um, the usage facility as a prototype, a comprehensive um, prototype for bad defect surveillance, not just identifying the disease, but also looking into associations, looking into policies, looking into how to solve the problems, their management and long-term effect. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ayede, for your, your uh, presentation on what you have had to do in advocating for having the government uh, consider and take on board uh, issues to do with bad defect surveillance. Uh, if anybody has any questions on the processes and what you would like to learn from Nigeria and from Dr. Ayede, please put it in the Q&A uh, and we shall discuss it at the end of this session. Next, I want to call our last presenter, uh, Mr. Joseph Okuze Waiswa. Mr. Joseph Waiswa is a research associate in the Department of Health Policy and Planning and management at the Makara University School of Public Health in Uganda. Uh, Mr. Waiswa he holds a degree in uh, 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 statistics from University of uh, Makara, and uh, he has also focused in his PhD on improving measures of stillbirths and neonatal deaths in standardized service. Welcome, Mr. Weisman. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. And today I'll be presenting um, about the Every Newborn In-Depth Study, uh, about measuring of uh, pregnancy, pregnancies and, pregnant, and birth outcomes, uh, looking at opportunities and challenges uh, based from, best based on uh, population-based surveys. Uh, this work was uh, co-led by the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Makere University, and was conducted in uh, five countries within five H health and demographic surveillance sites, and uh, was funded by the Children's Investment Fund Foundation, United Kingdom. Uh, so, uh, to start off with, uh, I'll give uh, some definitions of the birth outcomes. And overall, we have several uh, birth outcomes that span from uh, abortions, miscarriages, stillbirths, neonatal deaths, preterm pre births, complication, birth complications, and neonatal infections. Uh, notably, uh, these are the definitions for each of them. And notably, we uh, from uh, previous presenters, we note that uh, preterm births, uh, birth complications and infections uh, directly lead to uh, approximately 44% of uh, the neonatal deaths globally. Uh, in our study, we focused on uh, stillbirths and neonatal deaths, 
uh, but our experiences bring lessons on measuring continent, con congenital abnormalities in population-based uh, surveys. And uh, stillbirths were defined as uh, fetal death at seven or more months of gestation age, while neonatal deaths were defined as a death within the first 28 days uh, after birth. So, uh, so based on uh, this information, we have an, an opportunity and uh, an imperative to improve measurements uh, because currently the majority of the estimated 4.5 million stillbirths, neonatal deaths, and maternal deaths occur in low and middle income countries annually worldwide. Uh, the, from the population level based surveys, there is uh, scanty or no information about congenital abnormalities, specifically within the uh, DHS. And uh, this gives us uh, our first ever opportunity, uh, global goal uh, for reducing neonatal deaths uh, by 2030 and improving measurement for stillbirth. Uh, from this, we know that we uh, the major uh, data on stillbirths and neonatal deaths is from the demographic and health surveys, which is uh, denoted here as DHS and the multiple, multiple indicator cluster surveys. Uh, so however, there are some, uh, there is need to overcome the challenges that affect the measurement gap, which manifests through the underestimated stillbirth, underestimation of stillbirth, stillbirths in, in surveys. Uh, then there is uh, previously no rigorous uh, examination of of these of the different approaches and maternity histories used in in surveys. Uh, there is also uh, need to uh, look at the research question design and performance regarding the pregnancy outcomes and tracking. And finally, we ought to uh, examine the barriers and enablers that uh, affect the capture of the pregnancy outcomes. So. Uh, in low and middle income countries, there is uh, uh, there is an inverse data law between low and high income countries. So the high income countries, which account for less than one percent of deaths that occur annually, have uh, reliable data and registries such as uh, civil registration and vital statistics systems. While their low low and middle income counterparts, uh, where majority of these deaths occur. Uh, have rampant data gaps and mainly rely on population-based surveys to to do uh, to develop the the national and uh, and contribute to the international estimates. Overall, uh, ninety countries have uh, relied on the demographic and health surveys over the last four decades, and the multiple cluster indicator surveys, which uh, both run three to five years uh, every year, so they're quite expensive and these collect this data using maternity history. So in terms of the data and knowledge gap, there is an estimated four, 45 million births that are left unregistered in low and middle income countries. So to start off with, I'll give uh, a brief historical overview of how stillbirths and neonatal deaths have been measured throughout the life course of the demographic, the DHS, the Demographic and Health Surveys. And uh, for this sub-study, we uh, aim to systematically review the changes in the DHS program and how their potential effects on national stillbirth and neonatal mortality data. Uh, and we, have, we had two specific objectives, looking at uh, an overview of the measurement of the two adverse outcomes. And then uh, we also looked at the data quality of the two adverse outcomes. So in within the DHS, there are two uh, maternity histories that are implemented in a woman's questionnaire previously, the women uh, are 14, 15 to 49 years during the reproductive age. And these two are the full birth history, which avails to us information on all pregnancies and uh, that resulted into a live birth and seeks to uh, give us additional information on neonatal deaths, early neonatal deaths, uh, although early neonatal deaths are sometimes not reported. Uh, where, where a woman is not able to, or in settings where a woman is not able to uh, distinguish between 
uh, pregnancy loss and, and early, early neonatal deaths. Then data on stillbirths using this module is usually not collected unless extra questions are added uh, asking about uh, this particular event. On the other hand, for the full pregnancy history, uh, this avails to us information on all live births, miscarriages, abortions, stillbirths, early neonatal deaths and uh, late neonatal deaths, and fewer countries have implemented this module. Overall, uh, there has been no direct comparison until uh, our study of the two approaches. And on the right-hand side, side is a schematic impression of what the two uh, modules look like. So this is the full birth history, and both have three subsections. Uh, the first subsection uh, gives a detailed summary of uh, births, lifetime births and lifetime pregnancies for pregnancy history. Then the second subsection gives the detailed record uh, for each woman. But for particularly for the birth history, additional questions on pregnancy losses are in section uh, 2.3. Moving on, uh, through the maternity history uh, measurement procedures, uh, there, are, there are basically three approaches that are used. So the first, the, the first is the forward approach, which starts with the earliest events, uh, while the back, up, backward approach, uh, which, which starts with the latest events. And there is some evidence from uh, various studies in Bangladesh, which shows that the forward approach is better than the backward approach. However, the DHS uh, uh, remained with the backward approach because uh, there was not significant difference between the two. Uh, then the back truncated approach, uh, basically, uh, instead of covering the full history of the woman, you look at only the, the last five to six years. And this was piloted in two countries initially within the DHS, that is Peru and the demographic, Demo, Dominican Republic. Uh, the, this, this particular model had some advantages, which included reduced time of, for data collection and reduced costs. However, there were some disadvantages which includes uh, displacement of events. So by the interviewer or the respondent. So if a woman is asked uh, for births within the last five or six years, she could deliberately transfer one, uh, out, one, one birth outcome to a period before the period that is of interest. Finally, the calendar year, uh, this uh, basically uh, records the events in a table with rows representing the, the 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 representing the different calendar years used and and interviewers and respondents are guided through each year and month when the event occurred and probing through. So for this, the, the DHS uh, used used this particular approach from its first phase to its uh, sixth phase. Uh, just shortly, I'm showing you a snippet of what the DHS uh, timeline looked like. So it started in 1984 with phase one. And in this phase, there was no data on stillbirths. However, there was data on neonatal deaths, but this was never reported anywhere. In the second phase, additional questions were added to uh, gather data on stillbirths to countries that had a high prevalence, contraceptive prevalence. And in the fifth phase, uh, before the fifth phase, the DHS had two module questionnaires, one for the high contraceptive and low contraceptive countries. Uh, so uh, this figure here illustrates that the number of surveys that have been conducted within uh, the DHS phases one to seven by country, and over 300 surveys have been conducted worldwide since 1984. Uh, the DHS is currently in its eighth phase, and uh, this eighth phase is being piloted in Uganda. Next slide, please. So this is uh, a schematic uh, imp impression of uh, the different, uh, the DHS core module questionnaire using a birth, full birth history used from 1984 to uh, 2018 in phase seven, and the green, uh, shaded boxes represent the consistent questions that have uh, have been in the DHS through time. Orange shows the questions that have been reordered or rewarded. Uh, the black 
boxes show the questions that have been missing. So you see that in the earlier uh, DHS phases, there were uh, a lot of missing questions uh, which were introduced in the later stages. And in the most recent uh, phase seven and uh, six, we see a lot more additional questions added, including the questions on uh, the reverse truncated uh, timeline. Next slide, please. So again, we compared uh, the we compared data quality or stillbirth still birth rate and neonatal mortality rate ratios as a data quality marker in the DHS, and uh, we can see here from this slide that uh, overall the data quality was variable across all phases and by maternity history modules. There are a couple of there are just a few uh, countries that all surveys that had. Uh, uh, still birth rate ratio, st still birth neonatal mortality rate ratio of one or above. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to give you uh, highlights of the two sub studies where uh, we did the randomized comparison and uh, barriers and enablers com uh, of reporting this based on our previous studies. So next slide. Uh, so here we aimed to improve measurement on pre of pregnancy outcomes in population-based surveys, especially the large-scale platforms like the DHS. We had four uh, specific objectives. One was to randomly compare the two maternity histories for capture of stillbirth and neonatal deaths and the time taken to complete these modules. We also evaluated the use of existing or modified questions for capture of information on termination of pregnancy, miscarriages, birth weight, gestational age, and birth and death certification. Uh, we also compared our survey data with the routine health and demographic surveillance data where this study was conducted. And finally, we did uh, barriers and enablers. Next slide, please. So in terms of methods, we conducted the household survey with women using the World Bank survey solution software for data collection. The time taken to administer the questions was assessed using the time stamped audit trail from the para data. This is uh, an audit trail data that is collected alongside the, uh, the final survey data set. And we also conducted community uh, perspectives, community perspectives on barriers and enablers for reporting of these pregnancies and adverse pregnancies using focus group discussions with women and interviewers. Next slide, please. Um, overall, we interviewed over 69,000 women who are aged between 15 and 49 years in the five sites where we went. And uh, the women were randomized to either birth history or pregnancy history using the survey solutions app. Uh, we, in our survey, we had additional questions on postnatal care and fertility pre preferences. Our data collection happened per period of one year with predominantly female interviewers. And uh, the data was captured uh, on stillbirths and neonatal deaths. We also looked at the time taken to administer the questions. For the qualitative study, we interviewed uh, over 300 respondents in 34 uh, FGDs. Next slide, please. So uh, the highlight uh, results include uh, what we found in terms of time taken. So we found that there was a little difference in time taken between the two modules, a difference of one and a half minutes between the two modules. Next slide, please. Um, overall, we, we gathered data on uh, 1,600, over 1,600 uh, neonatal deaths within the last five year recall period. And uh, the distribution was even between the birth history and pregnancy history. We found no differences in uh, the two modules, as you notice. You note the the neonatal mortality rate was rate was between, was 25 for both modules, and these rates were comparable to uh, the country level estimates. Uh, next slide, please. So. Looking at stillbirths, we found, we gathered data on over 1,000 stillbirths within the five sites. And uh, our findings uh, were that the stillbirth rate was in the full pregnancy history was 21% higher than that uh, the stillbirth rate reported in the full birth history. Uh, within the four sites, if you just look at the 
uh, the forest plot there, we you can observe that uh, the the full bath hist the full, the steel bath threat was higher in four sites, uh, though it was generally lower than uh, the national expected estimates. Uh, we also, based on the uh, the overall uh, statistics, the I squared statistics uh, shows us that there was a site between site differences which were observed. And this was potentially because, because of potential omission and misclassification between uh, uh, steel bath and initial deaths and uh, then uh, differences in survey implementation. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm almost done. So from the qualitative study, we assessed the methodological, social, cultural, and uh, grief aspects. From the methodological, we looked at uh, uh, the barriers of reporting these pregnancy ad pregnancies and the adverse pregnancy outcomes in the survey. And some of the barriers were uh, around the tools, training, and understanding of the questions within the, the, the survey, and then the skills and knowledge of the interviewers. Then in terms of the social culture, we looked at uh, 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 there were barriers, including religious and cultural barriers and stigma to reporting uh, these adverse pregnancy outcomes, especially among uh, younger women. And uh, finally, uh, for grief, we found that uh, sometimes women were not able to recount or experience, uh, report these uh, 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 adverse outcomes because they did not consider them, you know, it's, it's still a, pre a pregnancy lost as uh, a birth. Overall, uh, the miscarriages, stillbirths, and uh, neonatal deaths had uh, uh, more reporting barriers compared to the child, child deaths. Next slide, please. So what did we uh, uh, learn from uh, the quantitative study? We learned that the full pregnancy history had potential for increasing capture of stillbirth. So I think this uh, can also uh, speak to the congenital abnormalities in case these questions are improved uh, or included. And then that the DHS-8 module uh, is now using the full pregnancy history based on uh, the recommendations from this study, and that uh, there is need for standard guidelines on implementation of this module, because we observed differences in uh, implementation within the different countries. And for further research, uh, we, 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 we recommend research around understanding omission and misclassification of silver in surveys, uh, further examination of para data, uh, to look at the questionnaire structure, to inform questionnaire structure and software design, and uh, further assessments around barriers and enablers for reporting this information. Next slide, please. Uh, this is my last slide. So uh, in terms of from the qualitative study, we uh, recommend uh, the following. Uh, translation of tools in, in different contexts, and then strengthening the interviewer's uh, skills and knowledge by uh, through trainings and ask, around asking questions for adolescents, and then uh, developing training modules that are interactive uh, for assessing questions on adverse pregnancy outcomes. And finally, having adequate, equipping interviewers with adequate information on, on, on uh, uh, these assessments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Uh, and thank you for taking us through the work that has gone on to try and improve on how to collect data. Uh, even if this one is um, focusing on stillbirth, it's very, very important because like said, we do not have reliable means of collecting data on stillbirth. So if we can use this tool, tool and especially through service that normally also help us record the levels of neonatal deaths, it would be very, very helpful. It's a good beginning. And I can see it's an initiative of every newborn uh, action plan from the results matrix. So thank you very much for taking us through. I know we will get the presentations so people can go through them and, and try and understand a lot, a little bit more. We can uh, look at the questions that have been put uh, there. Dr. Ayede? Um, uh, there's a question to you. 
Okay. Hello. Uh, which was looking. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, are there are other provinces in Nigeria also trying to do what you are doing in Ibadan? Okay. And that, that the answer would be no, in the sense that it, it depends on the capacity of the hospital. The hospital where I work, which is the University College Hospital in Nigeria, is the biggest, is a quaternary hospital. It has all the source specialties. So the essence of being that is for us to create a platform for whatever level of facility you are working you will be able to learn your own. So it is not for everybody to copy us because we are a level four facility. But whatever level you are working, we, we will be able to provide the technical expertise, the training materials, and then the feed environment for you to gain from in case you, you want to come and learn what, what we are doing. And we are already developing some of those tools. Thank, yeah, thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Ayeda. And I think it would be good to link with the WHO country office because I know two years ago there was a workshop actually in Uganda where Nigeria was very ably represented and they had some Ministry of Health staff. So maybe coming together, you can have a full story. Yes, uh, we still had a meeting last week with um, yeah. stakeholders. So we, are, okay. we, we, we work more. Thank you. Thank you. There is um, one from Babaka. Uh, let's see, what would be a, a representative sample size to assess the mean normal head circumference in a newborn? I think this is still to you, Professor, because you presented where uh, you indicated that we need um, ways of, you know, of the tech having proper ways of detecting because some may not be apparent at birth. Okay, there's another question to Professor, Professor Zash and team. Do you wish that you trained the nurses regularly on examination of defects? Hmm, do you wish? I think I heard that you only trained them once. Perhaps shed light on how many times you trained them. Sure. Um, yes, we trained them before, but we we aim to train every site again at least once per year. And um, as you probably know, the the midwives tend to move from site to site frequently, and so we found that if we didn't go back to the site to retrain, there were um, some midwives there who who hadn't had our original. Um, during COVID, this has been challenging, but before that. Uh, we did that at least once a year. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I should give one opportunity, you know, for a question that probably had not been answered. Okay, Desta, I can't, yeah, sorry, I can't you, see thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for uh, this great presentation. It's so fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. Um, uh, in my earlier life, I used to teach nurses, midwives, medical students. And uh, congenital malformation is a standard, standard lecture uh, topic for all these categories. So I don't know what happened later on, but uh, maybe two, you know, 20 years ago, it was one of the focus uh, areas in, the, in midwifery and the nursing uh, education. So in your, in your uh, 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 encounter, how did you find them? Did you find them really deficient in examination, identification of congenital malformations? That's one, so that we can give insight into the teaching institutions to strengthen the teaching of nurses, midwives in a sustainable manner beyond the project. Uh, I think this would be one of the secondary outcome. And lastly, I just want to find out in this project, how much uh, effort have you put to really build the capacity, national capacity, government capacity to really benefit from this experience 
and establish a surveillance system on bird defect. I was really astonished when I heard Joseph presenting, um, uh, making his presentation from five uh, 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 demographic health surveillance sites. So if they have already a surveillance site, a demographic and health surveillance sites. So it can nicely sit in their system, but the defect surveillance can sit there with some input, with some uh, uh, support. So have you really looked at the issue of sustainability and system building, government capacity building really to, 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 to take over this? Because this is an essential exercise. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to make it long. Over to you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Desta. Your question was to who? Because there are three, there are four people who presented. Is it the site I, in, in Botswana? It, is, it, or is, in... it is okay. All of them, it applies because all of them were teaching the nurses how to identify congenital <laughs> malformation and they were inter in interacting with midwives and so on. So it applies. Anybody can respond to that. And especially okay. just for the, with regard to the, the to democracy. The, yeah. Yeah. Linkage. Mm. Okay, Thank fine. You. I think I'll give this one to uh, Professor Zash. Um, <laughs> sure. So we found uh, varying levels of um, knowledge. Most everybody we trained uh, did know about the surface exam. Um, but there was uh, a, a knowledge gap around um, several specific defects, and we couldn't go over everything. Um, but we, we found that the, the video from WHO was, was excellent in terms of um, training uh, and to, to do it in a standardized manner. So I, I don't know where everyone was trained, and I don't know sort of the details, but, but some people knew very well and, and others did not. Okay, thank you. Uh, did, now I'll add a question. Did it matter the level of the nursing training? Because we know some are at a higher level than others. Uh, you can have a registered nurse, you can have a community nurse, you can have, you know, all those levels. Did it matter? Uh, yeah. Over to you. Did it matter? Um, I think most of the nurses that we were dealing with, these are midwives working in the government hospital, um, had very similar levels of training. Um, I think um, the age mattered a little bit. It seemed that the younger folks didn't have as much uh, as some of the older folks. And I don't know if that was from experience in the hospital or the actual way they were being trained uh, in their programs. Okay. Thank you very much. Ayeda, you want to add something? Just to say that if nurses are well trained with the videos and the pictures from the atlas of bad defects, they, they will learn the major defect. It's only the genetics one, maybe like the syndromes, that may be difficult. But with good training, they will learn it. And I agree that we need to go back to institutions so that we can advise on how to review the curriculum and incorporate bad defect terminologies and general uh, common ones into the, the training modules. Thank you. Over. Thank you very much, Ayede. And to Uganda, Joseph, and especially knowing that the Macquarie uh, Research uh, Consortium on this, but, uh, you know, is the one that is also anchoring this. And we have, uh, uh, yeah, the entity that I mean, how are you working as a team? Because you have a surveillance, uh, you have surveillance centers, and we would want to see the bad defect surveillance also anchored in an institution that can give it sustainability. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, for, for Sumta, for the question. Uh, so within Makere uh, School of Public Health, we have we're currently running uh, uh, an oversight, a USAID oversight uh, pro program for the next five years. And uh, one of the 
one of the uh, goals is to uh, basically improve uh, measurement and math outcomes uh, through uh, understanding uh, through, for example, doing MPDSR and uh, uh, institution health facility uh, trainings for health workers and midwives and through increased detection of these birth defects and so on. So uh, it's it's one of our our goals or objectives and uh, we'll, We've not done a lot around this, but especially for, for population level work, but for facility, at least I can say uh, that there is some work around this that is uh, rolling out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. I think now we need to bring this uh, uh, webinar to an end. So I want to thank everybody who has uh, managed to connect to this webinar, thank you, because without you would not have had any audience. I also want to give a special thank to the panelists for providing very uh, information that, that probably will give us more thoughts, because in all the presentations, we see that we are still at the beginning in our region in terms of gathering data on birth defects. So we are just setting up the surveillance systems. We still don't seem to have a clear path. I know a few countries, maybe like South Africa, they have a better developed system, but we are still at the beginning. 